An episode of medical history that many doctors would rather forget is told tonight in First Tuesday. Also a report on the correspondents whose stories shape the way Britain's seen by the rest of the world. First Tuesday, 10.30. This is Thames from London. The time is 10 o'clock. At the studios of ITN, Alistair Burnett and Pamela Armstrong. Is it Ovet's last exit? The girl who came back and the team who have. The miners' writ to force a national ballot. At risk now, the Gulf War spreads to Suez. And snapshots of a duke with curious friends. Good evening. Steve Ovetz being kept in hospital in Los Angeles for at least another night after his collapse in the Olympic 800 metres. He's had heart and lung tests, and doctors are checking now on whether or not his trouble could have been an entirely legal inhaler that he used to beat the local smog. Ovet's now almost certainly out of the 1,500 metres. It means he'll end his Olympic career without any of the medals he wanted this time. Sebastian Coe, who won the silver in the 800, said they were both getting a bit old for the top Olympic competition. Ovet and Coe looked comfortable enough as the 800-metre men scorched off at almost suicidal pace. But suddenly, as Coe went for gold, Ovet went to pieces. In a matter of metres, the pack had disappeared, leaving the reigning champion struggling all alone, clearly in big trouble. Way ahead, Brazil's Joachim Cruz literally cruised away with his title, while once again, Co had to settle for silver. Almost forgotten in the clamour for glory, Steve Ovet walked over the finish and into his own private hell. something was badly wrong. Though at that moment, even his old rival Sebastian Coe seemed totally unaware. Minutes ticked away, but Ovet still hadn't moved and Coe still hadn't noticed. Eventually, Ovet seemed to have recovered as the two great athletes moved together in a rare display of respect and sympathy. Coe turned, but checked again, trying to cheer up the fallen champion. Ovet's condition was clearly worrying the Coliseum medics as Coe trotted off to explain their exchange. A lot of people would be very sad that Steve could only trot in last. What did you say to him afterwards? Uh, well, just basically that I thought, I think we're both a little bit old to be playing with that kind of, uh, that kind of thing out there. Though the stretcher disappearing into the athlete's tunnel now suggested Ovid's problem was rather more serious. He's just, he's laying on the bench down there, he has a towel over him. He's not looking too well and he's not feeling too well. It was exactly three quarters of an hour after the race had finished when Ovet at last emerged. The official's view had been an understatement. Ovet, struggling for breath and sweating profusely, looked almost comatose as he was stretchered away. Harry Wilson, his worried coach, ran alongside. Ovet had managed to tell the doctors he'd felt unwell for some time. But by now, the symptoms appeared alarming as he was rushed out of the Coliseum. Experts at the official Olympic hospital immediately diagnosed a mild lung infection. But as the first tests were carried out, coach Harry Wilson revealed that Ovet's problems were more complicated and had begun six weeks earlier. It was then that the runner first experienced breathing difficulties, chest pains, sweating and pins and needles in his hands as he warmed up for the Olympics. Those symptoms, coupled with the Californian heat and the effects of an asthmatic spray he'd recently been using, had led to his near collapse. By morning, though, Ovet was back in good shape but still needing plenty of rest. The hospital said he could leave, but he asked to stay for further tests, still clinging to the hope he can attempt the 1,500 metres on Thursday. He's relying on doctors, but they won't commit themselves. I won't be in a position to address that until we see these test results. And again, my role as his attending physician will be merely to make a recommendation uh, to his team physicians and Steve. The decision will be his. You've spoken to him. Does he want to run in the 1500 He wants meter? very much to run. 
The British team know the odds are against Ovet, but no one can write off his iron will. A very independent young man. He's very strong uh, mentally and physically. Uh, he, he'll really have to be at a low ad before he, he turns down running in the Olympics. But he wouldn't run at the expense of, of damaging himself because he intends to stay for quite a time at the top in our sport. At a press conference, Steve Cram, fellow countryman and rival in the 1500 metres, revealed how Ovet's absence would have a demoralising effect. The fact that the team does well tends to pick them up, and if somebody like Steve does, um, in, like, in this instance, has collapsed and has been taken to hospital, um, it, you know, everyone obviously is very concerned about it and tends to be, become a little bit deflated and, and tends to worry a little bit themselves. Um, and the fact that he is such a, a prominent member of the team, I think, um, sort of accentuates that. And I'm, I'm sure everybody, myself included, will be wishing him well. Overt now lies in a hospital bed facing his biggest sporting decision. Should he risk his health or, at the age of 28, turn his back on his last chance of winning another Olympic medal? Terry Lloyd, ITN, at the Los Angeles Olympics. Steve Ovet is the latest in a long line of athletes pushed beyond endurance in top-class competition. The Swiss runner, nearly crippled by the Los Angeles heat at the weekend, has been told she'll make a good recovery. But Jim Peters, the British marathon runner of 30 years ago, says he still suffers from the effects of his collapse on the track. This report from Anne Perkins of ITN's Channel 4 News. The crowds watched appalled as the Swiss athlete Gabriella Anderson Schliessland staggered to the finishing line of the women's marathon. Although she had no chance of winning a medal, no one was allowed to help her. And next Sunday's men's marathon will be even tougher. It will be run at the hottest time of the day. It's not a new problem. At the London Olympics in 1908, the Italian Durando Pietri was almost carried over the line to win. His medal was promptly taken away. But perhaps the worst experience in living memory was Jim Peters. At the Empire Games in Vancouver 30 years ago, he was 17 minutes ahead of his nearest rival as he came into the stadium. He couldn't finish. I was completely dehydrated, you see, and when that happens, you lose your equilibrium and um, you just get the wobbles and everything goes blurred. Definitely, I, I didn't lose consciousness until after uh, Mickey Mays, the British team uh, physiotherapist, picked me up. But I knew then that I hadn't, in my heart, I hadn't won that race. Jim Peters hasn't been able to compete since. Now 65, his activities are confined to being president of the South End Athletics Club. And the doctor who looks after England's football squad admits that heat exhaustion is a major problem. Basically, it's the fact that you get dehydrated. You sweat so much. And as you sweat, so the things we call electrolytes, which are housed in the blood, come out in the sweat. And these electrolytes, sodium and potassium in particular, um, these give rise to extreme muscle weakness and uh, can sometimes, if the... Uh, if the potassium gets very low, can lead, in fact, actually to cardiac arrest. It was like running into quicksand. I was supposed to go down 14 times, but I only remember four. I never remember breasting that tape. He didn't. But now, in response to the pressure from television, whose main concern is getting good, live, prime-time pictures, regardless of the conditions the athletes have to perform in, it seems that the rules may be changed. Britain's team managers and selectors, though they don't admit it, must be getting as disappointed as many fans. Despite having one of the largest teams in Los Angeles, Britain is now in 10th place in the medal rankings, behind Finland, Australia and Japan. In tonight's events, though, Britain's hockey team, our surprise success, drew with Pakistan to get the better semi-final draw and a strong chance of a medal. John Whitaker on Ryan's son contributed 16 of Britain's 24 faults in the first show jumping round. America in the lead had only four. Whitaker began well but got into all sorts of trouble. West German with Paul Schockermuller is second with 20 faults, Spain third. Britain's with Canada and Switzerland on 24. Tim Grubb had a clear round. Pride of place is still with Tessa Sanderson's gold medal in the javelin. She failed in Moscow. The huge crowd were being treated to Tessa Saunderson's gold-winning sweet revenge in the javelin. With the very first of her six throws, she broke the Olympic record. And almost there and then, the crowd seemed to sense it would not be bettered. 
but Fatima Whitbread, her great friend and rival, who threw her way into third place to collect the bronze medal. Tessa's final throw was a mere formality. And as it landed, she knew she'd speared the gold. All the memories of Moscow four years earlier, when she was the favorite yet failed even to qualify for the finals, were forgotten. As the two British medalists hugged each other with true friendship and admiration, Tessa knew she'd made amends. Now it was time to show the crowd how she felt about her new Olympic title. Olympic champion Tessa Sanderson. Tessa continued saluting the crowd, but Fatima was busy cherishing her proud new possession. Then, for the first time at these games, the Coliseum stood to the national anthem with two British athletes on the rostrum. At home in Britain, Tessa's family had seen it all and were naturally delighted. But she said she was going to win the gold medal, and she's done it. And I'm very proud of her. And you sat up all night and watched it, didn't you? I have sat up all night and watched it. <laughs> I haven't been to bed yet. <laughs> and you had a telephone call from Tessa. What yeah. did she say on the phone? Well, she said, Mom, I've done it. I said, yes, I know. He said, did you see? The Daily Mail says it won't publish Zola Budd's Olympic diary tomorrow because it was told it's against British Olympic rules. Mr Charles Palmer, the chairman of the British Olympic Committee, told Miss Budd she was breaking the rule which forbids athletes writing as journalists during the Games. He said he was satisfied she had not understood the rule. The editor of the Daily Mail, Sir David English, said he had no intention of doing anything to jeopardise Miss Budd's chance of a medal. Two Yorkshire miners have taken out writs against their union to try to force a national strike ballot. They're two face workers at Manton Colliery, Mr Ken Fulston and Mr Bob Taylor, who's already complained about the Yorkshire NUM's handling of the strike. In May, he was butted in the head when he protested against suspended union meetings. And police are now mounting a 24-hour guard at the two men's homes. Both miners are married with young children. The first court hearing of the Ritz will be on Thursday, the day before the NUM special delegate conference. In Sunderland, 39 miners have appeared in court after paint and bricks were thrown at white-collar workers at a coal board stores. In Cumbria, five men are being held in custody after an attack on lorries at Maryport. Two drivers were hurt. And in Doncaster tonight, a crowd stoned the regional coal board headquarters and smashed windows. In Dunfermline, the Longanet miner, Mr Jim Pearson, got his van into work today after being turned back yesterday. Police and pickets clashed at the pit entrance and there were 11 arrests. In Wales, the coal board says the six-year-old Betis pit is deteriorating fast because the NUM won't help with repairs. The board says roadways nearly five feet high have collapsed to lower than 18 inches. The union says the NUM first questioned conditions at Betis before the strike. The distillers company, the big whisky men, say they'll close two plants and end 715 jobs. The brand names will stay, but the jobs will go to modern plants, while the old ones outside Edinburgh and in Glasgow will close. Distillers shut 13 Highland distilleries last year. When the Chancellor, Mr Lawson, knew that Britain's money supply was down 1% last month, the CBI's James Clemenson promptly told him today, cut interest rates. Mr Lawson's men merely told civil servants a pay rise of 4.5% was all they'd get. The unions want 7% and arbitration. And the pound closed down bumpily against the dollar at $1.3055, down over a cent. News that the Gulf War was spreading helped the dollar. Attacks on international shipping in the Gulf War appear to have spread to the Red Sea. Iran today made it clear it supports the mining of shipping lanes there. At least a dozen ships have been damaged in the last month and Tehran Radio said it was a blow against the scornful and arrogant policies of Washington, Paris and London. Earlier, Iraqi warplanes scored a direct hit on a Liberian tanker which had just left the Iranian oil terminal of Karg Island in the Gulf.
Today's news is complicated in that we're talking about two attacks on international shipping almost a thousand miles apart. And the big worry is that they are probably directly linked. The problem with the mines is in the Red Sea and the approaches to the Suez Canal. In the latest incident, a Liberian registered tanker was hit by a mine on Sunday. So were at least 12 other ships before it. But there's growing evidence that what's happening in the Red Sea has a great deal to do with what's happening up here, in the Gulf and on the borders between Iran and Iraq. The war between Iran and Iraq has been dragging on now for almost four years. Neither side has been able to deliver that final punch to knock out the other. But today, Tehran Radio said that Iran rejoiced at the sowing of the Red Sea mines, for which a Muslim extremist organization has claimed the credit, though the Iranian government said it didn't know anything about them. What's the connection? The answer is oil and the tankers that carry it. Once again, both Iran and Iraq have tried to cripple each other's war effort by stopping oil exports, which means hitting tankers. Once again, stalemate. So why not turn to that other vital oil route, the Suez Canal? Today, the canal looked peaceful enough. Ships passed through normally. But any problems here or in the approaches to the canal would especially affect Saudi Arabia, since tankers from their west coast ports make good use of the waterway. And problems for Saudi tankers means problems for the Saudi economy, which is just what Iran wants, because Saudi Arabia bankrolls Iran's sworn enemy, Iraq. The Egyptians have asked for help in clearing the mines, and the Americans have moved in quickly with special helicopters and ships to do the job. As it happens, Britain has four ships, similar to HMS Brecon here, which can tackle all kinds of mines, actually in the Mediterranean at the moment. However, government sources say that while Britain is disposed to be helpful, the ships won't go to the area until what they're expected to do becomes clearer. Inside the new holiday brochures, there's a warning. Next year's holiday may cost one-fifth more than this year's. A report on the cost a lot more next. Plus, a guesstimate on what marriage cost Richard Burton. And waiting for word in the DeLorean trial. That's in a couple of minutes.